Or even if not, even if you put out a jam, say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there's no reason why you can't go shine a light on it. There is a misnomer or a misstatement, a misperception about records after they fade out in terms of when you put it out and there's a certain shelf life, two or three weeks for dance music, to be honest, and then it fades away, meaning the interest wanes. Mm -hmm. But you can make a deal, big deal out of Yes, I did. <laughs> I learned. Black History Month, for Pride Month, for any occasion, you could you could attach your record to it if it fits, and that's if part it fits. of guys that you should, we all should be engaging in, you know. I did learn that a little bit. I learned the interesting thing about licensing, and the the one unique thing about my first record was it was a remake of Rufus and Chuck Khan. so it was an ongoing record. Any love was just always there. So to this day, that record still sells, and I'm like, I didn't know what I was doing when I did it, but it it I learned that. It, it, it's sustainable when it's a record like that. And the licensing that has to happen, like I didn't, I learned about territories over in Europe and this territory, <laughs> this record, like five different countries that have your record and each time it's licensed, that's another pay, you know. Those that are interested, the terminology is sub-licensing. Sub-licensing. Because, because you could have your record licensed to a certain country but then they will go ahead and create agreements so that your record is then distributed to other parts of those of that territory. And it gets very complicated and very convoluted. Um, and it, there's some crazy stories out there about what certain companies have done to trick others to jump into a market when they shouldn't have in terms of violating a licensing agreement. So there's a lot of stories out there about that stuff. So, um, and it totally changes the popularity of a record if you don't drop it in a, in a strategic way. Right.